is Israel's pullout from Gaza's Khan Yunus aimed at recuperation or restructuring? Just have a look at what Israel has been up to over the weekend. It closed its embassies in at least 28 countries around the world. Leave for combat units was cancelled. GPS navigation services were blocked. Air Defense Command was amplified. Bomb shelters were opened and more troops were placed at its borders. Clearly, something is brewing. What is all this in preparation of? America is confused. Washington does not know what Israel is up to. Israel says it is for rest and recuperation of its troops so they can be better prepared for future operations, including the planned Rafah offensive. But is it really meant for rest and recuperation? Or is there more to this than meets the eye? Perhaps a possible new front in the war? Let's just understand the possibilities of Israel's move. Possibility number one, Israel is speaking the truth. It has withdrawn its 98th division to prepare for future missions. Announcing its decision on Sunday, the IDF said that its 98th division had concluded its mission in Khan Yunus. The forces are exiting and preparing for their next missions. But then just how many Israeli troops have been pulled out remains unclear. Early on Sunday, the IDF army vehicles were seen heading to one of its bases in southern Israel. Apparently, they have left just one brigade there. The one brigade, named Nahal, remains in central Gaza, splitting the Palestinian strip in two and preventing the return of civilians from south to north of Gaza. You see, since the start of the year, the Israeli military has been reducing numbers in Gaza to relieve reservists. So this fits what Israel has been telling the world. But then by Sunday evening, the IDF chief of staff, Herzi Halevi, told a press conference that the military operation against Hamas is far from over, despite the withdrawal of soldiers. Which brings me to possibility number two. Israeli forces left southern Gaza to finally launch the Rafah offensive. We know that the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, has insisted that the Rafah operation is imminent despite the international condemnation. This plan has drawn. Israel, in fact, has said an incursion into Rafah is important to achieve its goal of eliminating Hamas from Gaza. Israel says that four battalions of Hamas fighters are stationed in Rafah. On Sunday, the IDF Lieutenant General Herzi Halevi said that the military is far from stopping its operations in the Gaza Strip. Following the withdrawal, Israel is adamant about its Rafah plan despite America being dead set against it. You see, Rafah sits in the southernmost part of Gaza and has become a shelter for hundreds of thousands of displaced Palestinians. It had been designated as a safe zone for, for civilians, in fact, fleeing the widespread destruction in the densely inhabited areas further north. At least 1.7 million Palestinians have been displaced as a result of the war. The entire population is at risk of famine. Back in February, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said warned that an assault on Rafah would put the final nail in the coffin of humanitarian aid operations, leaving Gazans without support. And then last week, Israeli forces admitted to killing seven aid workers, calling it an operational error. The U.S. and other Western allies have repeatedly called on Israel not to launch an all-out attack on Rafah. It is the last remaining area that has not come under the control of the IDF. All signs indicate that Israel is preparing for the Rafah offensive. But these are obvious signs. Does it mean they are real enough or is it something Israel wants us to believe? Because if it was, if the, it, if it was us reading the tea leaves, we would say something else is brewing here altogether. Which brings me to possibility number three. Israel pulled the troops from Gaza in preparation for a possible new front in the war. Like I mentioned earlier, Israel has shut its diplomatic missions and embassies in 28 countries around the world. Not just that, the country is in a state of heightened alert. What do you think Israel fears? Let me tell you. Israel fears retaliation, revenge from Iran. 
You see, last week, suspected Israeli warplanes bombed Iran's embassy in the Syrian capital of Damascus. The strike call a killed top Iranian military commander and marked a major escalation in Israel's war with its regional adversaries. How exactly? Israel has struck Iran-linked assets in Syria many times, but this was the first time that Israel carried out an attack on Iran's diplomatic building. In the aftermath, Iran, Iran naturally vowed revenge. Tehran said it reserves the right to take a decisive response and will deliver a slap to Israel. Israel has been on alert since then. It has cancelled home leave for combat troops, called up reserves, bolstered air defences. And today, the Israeli defence chief has declared that the country is prepared to handle any Iran scenario. The IDF knows how to deal with Iran, offensively and defensively. We are prepared for this. We have good defensive systems and we know how to act forcefully against Iran in both near and distant places. We are operating in cooperation with the United States and strategic partners in the region. The Iran-Israel shadow war has put the U.S. on high alert as well. President Joe Biden reportedly dialed the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, assuring him of America's support. But just hours after the Biden call became public, Iran issued a warning to the U.S. to stay out of the conflict. In a written message, Tehran warned the U.S. not to get dragged into Netanyahu's trap. Clearly, the regional hostilities have spread and so far Israel was fighting the so-called proxies of Iran in the form of Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis. And now, as tensions escalate, is an all-out war between Israel and Iran imminent? And is that why Israel pulled its troops from Gaza, you know, to prepare for another front? Will the Ukraine war turn into a nuclear war? Since Russia invaded Ukraine in February 2022, this question has been asked time and again. There have been provocations, attacks and retaliation, claims and counterclaims, and a series of warnings. In fact, Russia has issued a fresh one now. It comes from the Russian ambassador to Finland, Pavel Kuznetsov. In an interview with the state-run agency TASS, the ambassador issued a stern warning. He said that Russia will definitely retaliate if NATO's nuclear weapons are deployed on Finnish soil. Let me first tell you more about what he said. I'm quoting. Of course, we cannot but respond to potential decisions by the Finnish government in this sphere. Specific steps will be developed depending on real threats that these actions will pose to our security. And talking about the potential deployment of NATO nukes on Finnish soil, he said, and I'm quoting further, the Finns cannot but realize that such a major provocation will not be left without a Russian response. However, we expect that common sense would prevail. Not just that. The ambassador also said that the relationship between Russia and Finland cannot go back to the way it used to be, at least for now. Now, here's a quick background. Let me take you back to April 2023. That's when Finland formally became a member of the NATO. This was more than just an addition to the military alliance. You see, Finland joining the NATO was significant for multiple reasons. Sweden and Finland applied to join the military alliance in May 2022. This was, of course, after Russia invaded Ukraine. And one of the biggest reasons why this was a huge move was that for decades, these two countries had been neutral. And Russia back then called the addition a dangerous historic mistake that would force Moscow to take countermeasures. In fact, the Russian defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, back then said that Finland joining the NATO raised the prospect of the conflict in Ukraine escalating further. The Kremlin spokesman, meanwhile, that time said, Dmitry Peskov, saying that Moscow would watch closely for any NATO military deployments in Finland. 
And as for NATO, the Secretary General then has said that Russia invaded Ukraine over the eastward expansion of NATO and that in reality the invasion triggered what Russia was supposedly fearing. For Finland, it was the beginning of a new era. Now, cut to 2024, just last month, the pre Russian President Vladimir Putin called Finland's addition to the NATO a senseless step that made him send weapons to the border. And in the latest, the Russian ambassador to Finland has some tough words. What if nuclear weapons were placed on Finnish soil? How would Russia retaliate? And what would that mean for the situation on the ground? Would that turn this war into a nuclear war? You see, NATO members also have to provide military aid to other members if there is an attack, which basically means that if Russia takes action against, say, Finland, Russia risks a bigger conflict. And that is the last thing the world needs right now. With the Israel-Hamas war already increasingly showing signs of turning into a wider war, like we just told you, here's hoping common sense will prevail. past 9 p.m. IST and the once-in-a-lifetime solar eclipse has just begun. It's another 52 minutes till you can see the total sun covered. A phenomenon that will not be visible to people living outside North America. Nonetheless, we on will be getting you the live updates from this celestial event. And we are getting live visuals at this point from North America where people have gathered to view the celestial spectacle, the total solar eclipse. Millions of people, of course, around the world have their eyes on the sky right now. A rare total solar eclipse shadowing North America. To witness one of the biggest celestial phenomena, people have gathered across the US, Mexico, Canada. They are gathering in places along what is called the path of totality, which basically means cities, paths that fall along this path will see the moon fully obscure the sun. They will see a dark afternoon for a few minutes. And if the weather permits, people in cities like Austin, Dallas, Mexico as well, will be able to see the solar eclipse. For the cities outside the path of totality, a partial eclipse will be visible. It's pretty much a once in a lifetime experience to see an eclipse close up, especially at Niagara Falls. I don't think another good one will be for decades. And even though we're pretty far from home right now, this is still in driving distance. And for some, this phenomenon is cause for celebration. Just take the example of this young couple. They say that they have traveled from California to join the watch party at Niagara Falls with a plan to get engaged by the falls. Take a look. Another fun additional thing is that a little bit later there might be a little bit of a surprise going on that we're pretty <laughs> excited about. So yeah. big moment for us, definitely. Yeah. Big moment indeed. And there are some people, by the way, who chase that big moment, even if it means traveling around the world. Take Leticia Ferrer, for example. She is 63 years old. She lives in North Texas and she has witnessed 20 total solar eclipses around the world. I've seen 20 all over the world. All seven continents. Who knows what seven continents? Yay! Did you know there were six oceans? I've seen six oceans too. Now, at any other time, the beaches of Mexico are full of tourists. Today, the seaside city of Mazatlan in uh, Mexico is a hive of activity. Both locals and tourists have come to the shorelines. Across the city, one can see banners advertising the astronomical event. Antes estaba relacionado con, con desastres, con destrucciones. Ahorita no, ahorita es un fenómeno que pues, nos habla de la hermosura, yo lo puedo decir así, de la hermosura de la creación, de la hermosura de los astros. Entonces, no hay que temer, eh, 
en torno a los eclipses ha habido muchas mitologías, ha habido muchas, muchas situaciones que nos han, nos han alarmado. Y no, pues si fuera así, pues no hubiese tanta gente ahorita en Mazatlán que viene a presenciarlo. In fact, some are also praying that the eclipse will be good for business. The local fishermen hoping that the eclipse will bring good ocean currents so that they can catch a lot of fish and lobsters. Va a estar bien la, la pesca porque se mueve el mar. Cuando se mueve el mar es cuando son fluye, fluye las corrientes y las corrientes meten pescado, langosta, todo eso meten. Ojalá sean corrientes buenas también, porque hay corrientes que no meten nada de pescado. Hay a veces que no hay nada de pescado. Ojalá con el eclipse sean corrientes buenas para, para poder agarrar pescadito, langosta, todo eso. And astrologers who look to the stars for answers to many of life's questions believe that people are impacted by the alignment of the sun, the moon and planet Earth. And since this rare celestial phenomenon is happening in an election year, here's what they have to say about the upcoming election in the U.S. Trump's chart, the eclipse, not surprisingly, falls into the ninth house. Ninth house is legalities. He has a bevy of legal issues right now. And it's eclipsed, so he doesn't have the full clarity. He's basically in the dark. And what's really interesting is Mercury is retrograde. So maybe one of these gag orders could stick. <laughs> we'll see. Um, and then there, the ruler of this eclipse is in his eighth house. Eighth house, he's trying to, he needs money. Eighth house is finances. Eighth house is debt. But some astrologers say that the eclipse is not going to be bringing in gloom. Rather, we should see this eclipse as an opportunity to become more emotionally self-aware. There are tons of upsides to this eclipse. Now, on a personal level, the solar eclipse in Aries is an opportunity to become more emotionally self-aware as we deal with feelings that we usually like push aside. Anger, irritation, ambition, passion egoism, right? So we can come into greater self-awareness, greater consciousness, and that um, is a meaningful step towards becoming more whole, more aligned, and using our agency in ways that help us to become the kind of person we want to be in our lives and in the world. And let's now go straight to our correspondent, Susan Tehrani and Siddharth MP with us on the broadcast, taking us through uh, the minute-by-minute -minute developments. The moment is finally here. A lot of anticipation in the air, of course, in the run-up uh, to the total solar eclipse. Uh, uh, let me come uh, straight to you first, uh, Susan. Give us a sense of what things are looking like and uh, what the people uh, around you have also been uh, sharing with you in terms of the preparations that they have made uh, to witness this uh, celestial event. Hi, Molly. I'm standing in the middle of New York City's Central Park, and in just a matter of hours, this field behind me that doesn't have an obstructed view of the sky will be full of New Yorkers and tourists hoping to get a glimpse of that 90 uh, percent eclipse that we're going to witness here in uh, New York City. We do know that up by Niagara Falls, hotel reservations are completely booked. Uh, people have been traveling up there and then the Buffalo area in New York as well days in advance. But here in New York City, not only will people go to their local parts, but parks, but like I mentioned, they really want to come to places that they have a wide view, like this field behind me. Um, these glasses are very important. There has been constant uh, warnings about wearing these eclipse glasses uh, that have been authorized by NASA. Of course, some school children in the past had learned how to make eclipse glasses with cereal block boxes and whatnot. But if there is one commodity that's in high demand right now in New York City is these uh, special glasses to get a glimpse of that eclipse. Of course, the governor has said to be a very mindful because there may be a lot of car accidents during this time, considering the fact that not only people want to get to where they want to watch the eclipse, but also while they're driving, they might want to get a sort of peak of that eclipse. Airports may have delays as well, but we are expected to see a lot of traffic and congestion 
uh, but nonetheless, you know, I have my glasses ready. If I put them on right now, I don't think I'll be able to see anything I can't. But when I look up in the sun, surely enough, it's there and we're waiting. Waiting indeed. Let me uh, also bring in Siddharth MP onto the conversation. Hi, Siddharth. Uh, you know, a lot of talk also about uh, uh, the Aditya L1 mission and how it will be tracking and studying uh, the sun's behavior during this solar eclipse. What more can you tell us about that? So, hi, Molly. Let me start by telling you that uh, India per se as a country, anywhere in uh, the geography of the Indian subcontinent or in Asia for that matter, where it's night, it's not possible to see the solar eclipse. It's always this way that only the parts of the Earth that have daytime can witness it and that too, only along the track that the moon is actually visible and moon is actually blocking the sun. But what we have to remember is that for the last several months, you know, it's been a complete end-to-end uh, -end solar eclipse or, you know, 24 bar 7 solar eclipse for India's Aditya L1 spacecraft, which is at a vantage point almost one and a half million kilometers from the Earth. From there, in fact, Aditya uses a very special equipment that is called a coronagraph. They call it a visible emission line coronagraph. So only when the moon completely blocks the sun, the eclipse happens, right? But this is a natural phenomenon. But how do you simulate it? How do you sort of artificially perform it? That is what this coronagraph does. It actually completely blocks out the sun's light and only ensures that the outermost layer of the sun or the sun's atmosphere, known as corona, is visible. So using that, the sun's corona is studied using this particular equipment. So even today, the sun's corona is something that will be visible for a couple of minutes when this complete eclipse happens. And in the US, people will be photographing it and observing it. But we have to remember but that the, for the last several months, India's Aditya L1 spacecraft daily, minute by minute, has been studying the sun's corona, eclipse or no eclipse, because this special equipment on board Aditya can ensure that it is a complete eclipse view even when there is no solar eclipse happening. So that's the beauty about Indian space science and technology. In fact, even NASA and the European Space Agency have, you know, done missions uh, to study the sun. So this is in that regard. And let's also remember the fact that studying the sun's corona is very important because the corona is where, you know, a lot of high energy particles are emitted from the sun. And when they come to the Earth, there is also the danger that they can disrupt high tension power lines. In, uh, in the past, it has happened in Canada and in Zurich. And also, these can also damage satellites that are orbiting the Earth, which is why it's extremely important to study the sun's corona. The sun's coronal studies can be done only during an eclipse. Right. But obviously, eclipses happen once in a couple of years. And the eclipse happens only for a few minutes or a couple of hours. So at that time, the observation is very limited, which is why space agencies send missions to the Lagrangian point. And then from there, they get an unobstructed 24-7 view of the sun. For several years from now, Aditya will be studying the sun's corona as though there is an eclipse non-stop. So that's the significance of the Aditya L1 craft. Which is why it's all the more important to make the most of the duration as far as this uh, total solar eclipse is concerned. We already have those visuals of those uh, large number of people who have gathered uh, to witness that event for themselves. It's been called a once-in-a-lifetime celestial spectacle. Going back across to Susan, who's been getting us those updates from New York. Uh, Susan, we have already talked about the path of totality. We've also been getting our viewers the reactions coming in from different quarters, you know, astrologers weighing in on what this means for the U.S. in an election year, for example. Also, a lot of uh, beliefs, myths, superstitions, perhaps, that are associated with a solar eclipse. So if you can just share with us uh, some of uh, the uh, recommendations that have been made uh, and uh, some of those um, myths that have been busted as well. Yeah, you know, social media is just the perfect environment these days uh, for not only astrological predictions, but also really p trying to sew things together and make sense of everything. I'll give you an example. Now, this does not mean that we're endorsing it or it's valid in any sense. But one clip that went viral was uh, where some uh, astrologers and also mm, regular people were saying just on Friday, we had a 4.8 earthquake here in New York City. And and lo and behold, on April 8th, which is 4-8, we have an eclipse. So 
anything can go. Uh, we have to be careful of a lot of advice on basically don't make big decisions or others say that absolutely this is a time of clarity. Uh, so yeah, as you mentioned, you know, there is a lot going on right now. There are, you know, some aspects that we can really uh, take note that in detail. And that's the fact that back in 2017, that was interesting. But what makes this one interesting in 2024 is the sun was, first of all, a lot calmer in 2017. But in 2024, this year, the sun is uh, has a lot more rays. And, you know, while we're looking, if we're lucky, we may e we even see some sparks and maybe some kind of um, flame and explosion as well. So, you know, those are the things that have been s sort of correlated by w by some that, you know, something major is going to happen uh, during this time. But we're going to keep our fingers crossed right. and hope that if anything major does happen, it's for the good, of course. Yeah. We're leaving it there for the moment. Susan and Siddharth, thanks very much for joining us with those updates.